How'd you like to get that EVGA keyboard and mouse for just about half off? That's the EVGA Elite program. And you can sign up, and it doesn't cost anything. You can also get in the queue for GPUs, things like the RTX 3090. You can sign up and, uh, you know, at least get your name in the queue so that eventually when it does restock, there's at least the option to buy. But you also get discounts and coupons and special access to things and stuff like that. EVGA is building their elite member army. Level 1 Techs has a code, so at checkout if you want to use our associate code, Level 1 Techs. We get a little bit of a benefit from that. It is an affiliate code. But EVGA sponsored this video. So thanks EVGA. Be sure to check out that affiliate program. And you know, you get 24 hours of early access when they come out with new hardware. So if they're coming out with a new model GPU, hint hint, you can put your name in the ring to reserve one 24 hours before everybody else. It doesn't cost anything to join. Really all you're giving up is your email address for EVGA. Why not? I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. Thanks EVGA for sponsoring this video. Be sure to check out that link below, sign up for the Elite program, and tell them we sent you. Uh, confession time. The faster the SSD doesn't necessarily mean the faster the SSD. Remember last year when we all got really excited and we're talking about PCI Express 4 and some of the very first generation, like the Fison based, you know, two and three terabyte and four terabyte, two and four terabyte uh, SSDs were coming out and it was, oh my gosh, we can get five gigabytes per second on this, you know, tiny little M.2 gum stick. There's more to the story than just transfer rate. It's also IO latency and how well it handles multiple simultaneous requests. So it's down to IOPS. The number of IOPS that you can complete in a given time generally is how responsive and snappy the system is, but there's a special case. And the special case is Q-Depth 1. So Q-Depth 1 is when one request depends on another request, depends on another request, depends on another request. And this is something you run into, you know, with a single user operating system. You don't really run into this with servers. You don't really run into this with things that are running in, in parallel. Uh, but a lot of the time, that Q-Depth 1 translates into why is it taking forever to load this program? Because something's not super optimized, and so it's basically, get me this block on disk. Whatever's in the contents of that block on disk tells me the next block that I need from disk. And so how quickly you can get that block and then get the next request and get that block and get the next request determines how fast it actually is. It's not the bandwidth, you've got plenty of bandwidth, but you know, not a lot of latency. Think about, um, you know, if you're walking along a hallway and uh, somebody's coming the opposite direction. Is the hallway wide enough that you can sort of pass by each other without anything bad happening? Or do you have to kind of stop for a second so that you know everything works exactly the way that it should? Well, packet flows, packets of data, are not really a lot different than that. And at the end of the day, I've got Threadripper Pro, and I want to build a system that's gonna break the world record for IOPS. Now, when we're talking about different things, there's different world records. One of them is for uh, hyper-converged systems. And so this would actually be a cluster of three different machines, not just one. And uh, the world record for hyper-converged IOPS, I think is around 14 million IOPS, give or take, but that's for a cluster of machines servicing a bunch of requests. Uh, when you look under the hood though, what's happening there in that cluster of machines, every machine pretty much has local storage, a local copy of the data set. And whenever there's a write, the write is synchronized across all machines in the cluster, but reads, all oh, those reads, those reads are technically local. So it's really fast. 20 million IOPS, I'm not sure we could do it with the hardware that I have. Oh, I mean, Threader for Pro, don't get me wrong, there's, there's not a better workstation that you can get right now. I think, pretty sure, 512 gigabytes of memory and all of the other stuff with this many PCIe lanes, 128 PCIe lanes in a single socket? Yeah, you can't get that anywhere else. 10 million is pretty easy, you just, drop fast SSDs in and you're good to go. That's pretty much all that you've got to do. I mean, the very fastest NVMe that you can get, like the P5800X, if you could get like six of those, you're at 10 million IOPS. It's not a problem. But 20? It's gonna take some elbow grease. Is 20 million IOPS even reasonable? Well, let's do some napkin math. You know, back of the envelope math. That's, I don't know what, what you would call it if not napkin math or back of the envelope math or whatever. All right. Main memory bandwidth, we've got eight channels. So theoretically, absolute maximum is 200 gigabytes per second. 
real world, you know, we do the A to 64 test, it's on the order of about 150 gigabytes per second. So 20 million IOPS, 4K each, because the SSDs have to read it somewhere. It's got to go to main memory, right? I mean, that's that's how we're doing this. So we do that. It's about 61.44 uh, gigabytes per second. If I moved all the zeros there. So it's about half main memory bandwidth. And that's probably about right. I mean, that you're sort of dealing in, you know, orders of magnitude here. If it's, oh, we're within 5%. I've got some news for you. There's this little thing called overhead. It's not going to work. It's not going to fit. It's going to be a little bit more problematic. <laughs> and it's another thing to consider. It's like, oh, you could run four or six channels of memory with Red Ripper Pro, but when your main memory bandwidth suffers and you're looking at building something like this, that performance is also going to suffer. Hey, maybe a future video if you want me to like run the tests because there's that long forum thread that has all kinds of stuff. But let's let's keep doing the napkin math for a second. What about on the PCIe side? Well, PCI Express 4.0 has doubled the bandwidth of PCI Express 3.0, so 16x slots can do 32 gigabytes per second in each direction. Some documentation says 64 gigabytes per second, but that's reads and writes simultaneously. For the thing that we're testing, that doesn't really apply. So 32 gigabytes per second per socket. 64 gigabytes per second if I use two X16 slots, and I've got two of the uh, Asus Hyper uh, M.2 add-in cards. So if I had some add-in cards that could do 120 gigabytes per second, the PCI Express bandwidth is there. So that napkin math checks out because that's that's got a margin of basically double as well. Double is usually reasonable for you know overhead included calculations. So our napkin math checks out, but we're gonna have to go a lot deeper than that. My first device, my first PCI Express device, the Intel P5800X. I bought this. I paid a lot of money for this. Too much money, in my opinion. But 800 gigabytes and over 2 million IOPS in a single device. It can saturate PCI Express 4.0 by 4 interface here. So that's right at 8 gigabytes per second. But my goodness, that's fast. Unfortunately, because of the price, I've only got the one of those, but I do have some older Optane. We'll talk about those in a second. Interkeoxia. They're sort of indulging me a little bit here on my mad science, but they loaned me a bunch of CM6 SSDs. Now, these are pretty respectable SSDs in their advertising material and stuff like that. They're talking about uh, drives that are on the order of 770,000 IOPS per second. 4K random read, which is pretty class leading for NAND based flash devices. Optane is something else entirely. Like it's different, I mean, it's storage, but it's something different. And it's also only 800 gigabytes, whereas, you know, you can get up to 16 terabytes in good old flash and NAND flash in the U.2 form factor. I've got like 10 of these, so we can shove 10 of these in this system and get something approaching 7.5 million IOPS, assuming it scales linearly, which is an assumption I'm making for now, but something we're gonna investigate, so let's let's keep digging. Now, I also happen to have one Keoxia CM6. This is a like more enterprise, more performance-oriented drive, and this is, of course, gonna be a little bit more expensive, but that's between 1.3 and 1.4 million IOPS, depending on which model you get, at least according to Keoxia's advertising material. But like the P5800X, I uh, only got the one. But I do have a rather large assortment of older CM5 and some, uh, you know, M.2, uh, Keoxia and Toshiba before it was Ke uh, Keoxia, uh, storage devices that are between 500 and 750,000 IOPS each. I mean, we could really add a lot to this system if we want to go nuts, and, and we will, don't worry. I've also got a bunch of older Optane, P4800X and also the M.2 form, fa form factor. You know, the 300-ish, 300 to 307, well, 280 to 375 gigabyte Optane d devices. Those are older, but those will usually clear, you know, 500 to 750,000 IOPS. And finally, I've got Samsung 980 Pros. Those advertise 1 million IOPS. So check it out. For our first configuration, we've got four Intel NVMe, the P5800X, and three 375 gigabyte M.2 Optane drives, and 10 of the CM6 from Keoxia. That's 7.5 million IOPS just for the Keoxia drives, plus, you know, like three-ish million should be, again, napkin math from the Intel Optane drives. That's pretty smoking fast. We're using FIO to do all of our testing. FIO is the industry standard thing. It's got a bunch of different IO engines you can plug into it. You can really do a lot of tuning, real world simulation with it. 
FIO is a really, really good tool to do for this kind of testing. And mainly, mostly what we're interested in right now is random reads. I'll get into random writes and I'll get into database workloads and I'll get into concurrency and all that other kind of stuff, but probably in a future video. So uh, stay tuned for that. Get subscribed, whatever, I don't know. If you want to support mad science, support level one. So we run this, what do we get? 6.8 million IOPS. So I spent a lot of time on this, sort of poking at it and looking at it and thinking about it and thinking it through. And to understand this, you have to think about how Threadripper is built. It's a bunch of chiplets and there's an IO die and all of our memory goes through that and all of our IO goes, goes through that. But some chiplets are closer than other chiplets. And there's definitely a path that you have to take from A to B. So we can use a tool like LS Topo. This lists the system topology. And so this shows the layout of the system, which things are connected where. And we can see that I happen to choose a physical arrangement of PCIe devices that is suboptimal. They're all sort of on one side. So some of the cores have local access to all of the NVMe, but some of the cores have to go all the way across the IO die to get to the NVMe. See, it's eight memory channels, but it's really four groups of two memory channels. So what I need to do is move half of my NVMe to a physically different slot. Well, that's not a problem. There's seven slots total in our ASUS WS Sage Pro, Third Pro Pro motherboard. Moving a slot, not a problem. And so with that in mind, you know, we're, we're not venturing off into uncharted territory here. AMD's actually got you covered for this scenario. There's two options in BIOS I would call your attention to. One of them is called Preferred I.O. And so if you happen to be running a really wicked fast PCI Express 4 SSD, something like the Liquid Honey Badger, that's one device and one, you know, you can't split it up, you can't share it across CPUs. Preferred I.O. here will let you specify which PCIe bus should get priority across the Infinity Fabric. And that solves this problem. So if I had a single storage device hanging off of a single X16 PCI Express card, or even X32, if the two X32 slots were on a single node as we have here, I can prioritize that bus by putting in the bus number here in the BIOS. And then the performance will improve because all the knobs and tunables at a really low level in the system will prioritize that IO. The other thing is NPS4. You see, even though we have a unified IO die, it's still possible to uh, pass hints to the operating system, or alternatively, if you're on Windows and Windows struggles with understanding NUMA nodes, you can do NPS4. Most of the time you don't need it. But for some of these edge cases where you need a little bit more visibility into what's connected where, you can go into the memory controller options and set NPS4. And then you actually get four NUMA nodes that will show up in the system topology. So the output of LS Topo will change and it'll give you a little bit more sort of direct insight into how everything is in the system. So yeah, we get it up and running, 11 million IOPS, 11 million and change. That's pretty good. And that's, that's sort of what I put on Twitter the other day and everything was actually working really well. But we're already starting to see a little bit of fall off. And what I mean by that is if you test each device individually now and you add up that number, that is a much bigger number than what you get when you test all of them simultaneously. That's the whole people in the hallway thing again. When everybody's in the hallway, uh, when, when all of the infinity fabric bandwidth and all of the PCIe bandwidth across the entire system is being used with these just mad crazy benchmarks, uh, things have to shuffle around a little bit in order to get everything to fit. And because of that, you have a little bit of a bandwidth penalty. Now, you know, theoretically, 12 million and change IOPS versus 11 point something, the overhead is very low. That is perfectly reasonable and completely tolerable. But what if we get unreasonable? Now we've got 28 <laughs> NVMe in Threadripper Pro. Why, don't, don't ever do this. This is crazy. 28 NVMe in Threadripper Pro? Are you a madman? Yes. Yes, I absolutely am 100% a madman. 28 NVMe has no business here. But we can do it. So 28 devices, including 9 million more IOPS from those Samsung 980 Pros, eight of them add to the mix. What do we get? Uh, that should be 20 million IOPS, right? The napkin math says, oh, it's 15.2? 15.2 million IOPS, what's going on? Okay, we've basically hit <laughs> the bandwidth limit. These are spread out all over the system. And I've got a couple of them that are actually running at PCI Express 3 speeds because some of the sketchy adapters that I got from Alibaba won't run correctly at PCI Express 4. So, uh, but 15.2 million IOPS, hey, that's better than 14.8. That's a world record, right? Kinda, yeah. I think about 15.2, 15.3 million IOPS is all I'm gonna be able to get this 
generation or this iteration or for this video. Uh, future video, I'll probably revisit this. I mean, I, it, it goes without saying I've got to try to get 20 million IOPS on Epic Milan. Certainly a two socket Epic Milan system with double the memory channels and double the PCIe root complexes to spread the bandwidth over. 20 million seems a lot more reasonable. I mean, if we could do 15 on this, we probably push 25 on a two socket system, probably. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself. The, the napkin math is dangerous. You don't necessarily want to paint yourself into a corner with napkin math, but yes, definitely something to check out in a future video. I also want to try to get my hand on a liquid honey badger because those are fast. I spent a lot of time working on this and there's actually a lot going on here under the hood. There's things like um, the scheduling algorithm, like how does the Linux kernel schedule IO across such a huge number of devices? Well, out of the box now, the Linux kernel uses something called hybrid polling. And this is something that's popped up on this channel, you know, kind of a lot over the last year, but it's a default out of the box now on the Linux kernel for high performance NVMe, which is great. So if you're running a, a modern uh, desktop distro, all of the performance knobs and tunables that you can do in software are mostly pretty much always there. Uh, there's things like read ahead, turning read ahead off or turning read ahead on. They can make a difference in my specific scenario. It didn't really make much of a difference. If anything, it sort of hurt performance. Um, FIO also has different IO engines that I mentioned before. Sometimes you can find an IO engine that'll actually work a little bit better. You can also switch to 100% straight polling. Instead of hybrid polling, which uses a combination of interrupts and just waiting for the drive to complete, it'll actually just poll the drive continuously. This uses a lot more CPU overhead, uh, but forgetting the world record on IOPS could be a good thing, although you wouldn't really want to do that in most real world scenarios. And if you think through and do the napkin math on how much CPU overhead we have here, in terms of like the number of CPU cycles that you have versus the number of uh, IO requests that I'm generating for the CPU utilization, the number of CPU cycles that occur for a block transfer is on the order of 10,000 instructions. 10,000 instructions with a 4.2-ish gigahertz processor is a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. But when you're chasing 15 or 20 million IOPS, there's a lot of drops in that bucket. And before you know it, you've got, you know, the bucket is full. It's full of lots and lots of yummy, delicious PCI Express 4 data. In the real world, the CPU utilization wouldn't really be this high because the IO wouldn't really be this random. You see, when there's a relatively small amount of IO, it tends to be random in real world usage patterns. And then for data processing, which is one of the things we're working on for another video, uh, it tends to be more sequential. And so when you ask the NVMe, transfer a megabyte of information or transfer this list of blocks or you know do this long complicated sequence of things, uh, the NVMe is able to do more work on its own without bothering the CPU. So to achieve 60 or 70 or 80 gigabytes per second, which this array can do no problem, uh, the, I mean, again, it's, we're, we're, we're hitting that main memory bandwidth limitation again. Uh, the array is so fast that if it's copy large blocks of information from the NVMe to memory, and it's continuous and it's not a million little random blocks, there's virtually no CPU overhead in doing that. The CPU overhead comes from the sheer number of requests, which have all been randomized. So it's not really exactly 100% real world representative either. The fact of the matter is that we've got single NVMe storage devices that are approaching being able to handle 1 million input-output requests, input-output operations per second. And the reality is that, you know, a single core, if it is truly random to saturate that many possible IOPS per device, you're looking at having to use more than one CPU core per device to keep it busy, which is sort of crazy. Like, that's the world that we're in. One million IOPS on the Samsung 980, well, that's gonna keep about three of these Threadripper uh, Pro cores busy servicing that, mil that many IO operations. That Optane, that P5800X, if you wanna get two and a half million IOPS out of it, which is about where it tops out, you're looking at about five threads on the Threadripper Pro for truly random IO. Now remember, real world, you're probably not dealing with that much random IO, real world, in a, such a short amount of time. But it is nice for a benchmark. So yeah, admittedly, 28 NVMe, it's not real world. The testing itself is not exactly real world, but it is useful for telling us 
what the hardware is capable of at kind of a base level. So in a way, this kind of testing really is just more napkin math, but it's like the real world napkin math as opposed to the, you know, armchair conjecture na napkin math, if that makes sense. There is plenty of uh, knobs and tunables that I can still do, so there's plenty of material here for a future video. And in fact, if you have ideas for stuff that I should try or look at, you should post in the level one forums. I've created a thread with a rundown of some of the FIO performance parameters for some of these different devices and some of the stuff that I encountered for random reads, of course. Uh, in the level one forums, you can check that out, reply there, let me know what your ideas are. It's probably some pretty interesting stuff going on here. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I want to hear from you in the level one forums. If you found this interesting, or you have any questions or something that I can include in a follow-up, come to the forums, post, let me know. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.